I was always the person that found a way to dive head first and learn how to swim after. Of course, that lifestyle progressed and progressed until the point where it got dangerous. Blacking out, I was in basements with people smoking meth, and I was scared for my life behind the wheel one night, intoxicated with my best friend. And then the next moment, like the blink of an eye, we were heading towards a tree. I woke up to try and find my best friend unconscious and not waking up. Shortly after that impact of that crash, I tried a very emotional act, and I tried to take my own life. All right, what's going on, everybody? That was tonight's guest, Cody Demeray. My name is Daniel Unmanageable, and this is Hard Knocks Talks coming at you from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Treaty Number no. 6 territory, and the traditional homeland of the Métis people. Let's bring in Cody. What's going on, brother? Hey, guys. Oh, just happy to be here, Danny and Donna. So thankful to be a part of this uh, podcast and the YouTube channel that everything that you got rocking, I've never seen more expertise put into something like this. And it's it's an honor to be a part of it. So thank you. Mm. You're very welcome. Um, I, I still have to chuckle under my breath when people say expertise because I swear to God, man, I'm hanging on for dear life over here. <laughs> I'm like, I'm expertise like a toddler. and honest. Yeah, I'm like a toddler at the wheel of a freight train, man. Just like, hang on. There's a reason I say buckle up at the end of every description. He's like, man, this is this is a roller coaster. Let me tell you. So, but anyways, uh, is there anything that you would like to say tonight before we dive in? You know what, buddy? I'm just I'm ready to I'm ready to dive in. Actually, you know, Sunday night tonight, I uh, had a good family day today with my beautiful fiance and my beautiful daughter, and I'm I'm ready to spend a couple hours with you guys tonight. So, all right. Well, let's not waste any time. Let's go. This is Hard Knocks Talks. <clears throat> Okay, before we dive in, I just want to let our viewers and listeners know that tonight's live production is sponsored in part by Prairie Harm Reduction in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and Naranon Groups of Regina and Saskatoon. For more information on all our sponsors, to stay up to date on our upcoming live streams, check out our merch, find all our audios and more, go to www.hardknockstalks.com. Cody. Where do we even begin? I know we had you on uh, almost a couple of years ago now, and uh, a lot has happened since then, but we cannot just move forward uh, without going back a little bit because there's probably a lot of new people watching tonight. So why don't you start uh, at the beginning? Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up? Yeah, for sure, my man. So how I was brought up, actually, I was brought up most of my life by my single mother here in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan who I definitely know did the best that she possibly could with me. I was a very stubborn person, very angry person, and I didn't know how to communicate very well. And I took it out on pretty much everyone that I cared about, including my mom. So how, how long or how, how early on did that behavior start? And like, why were you so mad? My mom worked at Warehouser here in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. You know, the pulp and paper mill. It was pretty much a staple of Prince Albert. Seven hundred people including you know truck drivers delivery drivers people that serve food in the cafeteria about 700 people actually worked at this facility and that was right around the time when my mom and all those other of course employees of the of the mill got a letter saying you know what hey you're gonna have to find a new job i remember working around 11 years old actually you know on the weekends and summertime came around and almost full time to try and save up a few pennies and a few dollars and actually put in my own, you know, my work ethic so that I could actually come and play hockey here in Prince Albert. And so I grew a little angry because I looked around, you know, a lot of people my age, similar situations, but no one else really had to work. It's something that I look back on now and I probably wouldn't be here to this day with some of the successes that we've been able to accomplish. If I didn't have that work ethic ingrained in me back then. Is that where some, like you mentioned you were angry, but is that where some of your anger came towards your mother? You know what? It, it Subconsciously, it might have. And looking back on it, I think it probably did, actually. Um, I held a little bit of resentment that I had to, to go and do that. You know, and you know, after watching the Prince Albert Raiders play hockey to the intensity that they did, uh, 
seeing that team, you know, commitment, everyone patting each other on the backs, you know, the smiles on the benches. I quickly grew into loving that atmosphere. And so, of course, right around that time, that's when my mom lost her job and I got the bright idea for next season that, hey, you know what, I want to play hockey myself. And I still remember to this day asking my mom to play hockey back then, right after she lost her job. And, Mm. you know, I seen a pain, a sadness in her eyes because I didn't know this at the time, but my mom was a little worried about how she was going to pay, you know, simple things like the mortgage or power, you know, put groceries in the fridge, of course. And and what 11 year old would think of that, really? Tell us a little bit about the first time you got loaded. Like what were the circumstances and, and how did it make you feel? Pretty soon, you know, after that hockey season, that first one was over, I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol because, well, I still have disposable income in my pocket. And what else do I spend my time with? I started experimenting, but the person that I am, like how my DNA makeup is, is that I'm not a person that just dips his toes in the water, right? I'm a person that dives, sorry, dives head first. And like your preview showed, I'm a kind of person that tries to learn how to swim afterwards. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, the first and you're time still like, like that. Hey? <laughs> and you're still like that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, yeah. buddy. Definitely. Yeah. A little bit more channeled in the more productive way of life. But of course, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah. So you loved it then. You, the first time you got loaded, you're like, I'm home. This is amazing. I'm going to do this all the time. Is that how it went? You know what? It, it did, actually. And like, you know, the first time was probably a, a beer or two. The second time was a bit more. The third time was a bit more. The fourth time was a bit more. But deep down inside, I was trying to fill an emptiness, a hole that I had deep down inside. That was one way that I found out I fit in pretty good because I was pretty soon a person that was able to consume as much alcohol as anyone around me at you know, mm-hmm. 12, 13 years old. And pretty soon it, I gained a reputation for myself. This kid is you know drinking and smoking weed and he doesn't care what others think about it, but so people, yeah. so other kids were asking you, what were they asking you? Cody, are you drinking? Like, Cody, are you smoking weed? And things of that matter, you know, started to have the whispers around my classmates and things of that matter. And mm-hmm. I started also feeling excluded in a few different realms of things, you know, like some friends that I might have been hanging out with at the time, uh, you know, possibly were getting told by some of their parents that uh, maybe, you know, if this is happening with Cody, maybe you should stay clear a little bit. And I, you know, As a young father now, I can kind of understand where those parents were coming from. Of course, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't want your very vulnerable and fragile 12, 13, 14 year old kids to be introduced to drugs and alcohol. You know, Mm -hmm. I can understand that, but uh, it it felt hard to hear those comments and those feedback loops uh, from kids in my classes at those times, of course. I know like for me, like when I, when I first got into it, it was like a rite of passage for me uh, when I started mm. to hear things like, oh, yeah, that guy, you know, he's trouble. Like, I kind of was like proud of that. You know, like I held that close to my heart because that was something, you know, like people are talking about yeah. me in some capacity, you know, so I'm, I'm making yeah. waves or whatever that is. Uh, was there any of that for yeah. you? Was there ever any pride in how much you could, you know, party and drink and smoke? You know what, buddy? You hit the nail on the head, actually. That's exactly the way I felt because, you know, it it felt as if, okay, well, I'm not a very good hockey player. I'm not a very good basketball player. You know, I didn't join lacrosse or whatever growing up. And, you know, all these things that a lot of the classmates that I had, you know, had a what's called a belonging to basically, or, you know, I wasn't very familiar with my Métis heritage as I am now. You know, I didn't grow up being you know brought into the culture the heritage so everyone where i looked a lot of times actually had these these identities to them uh you know whether they were a good hockey player a good soccer player a good football player whatever it was and i was just this kid that you know just learned how to play hockey i was this kid that wasn't naturally gifted at any sport but i did love playing sports you know i just i found like i was trying to find my way to fit in this world so often that I took the easy path like we mostly do in our lives now and knowing this subconsciously i you know i started leading into the addictions because it was familiar with me and you know what pretty soon i found out i can drink with some of the best of them and i can smoke weed with the best of them and when you tell somebody hey you're good at drinking or you're good at anything in this world 
what are you going to continue doing? That positive <laughs> reinforcement, whether or not it was, you know, a destructive, destructive tendencies, of course, but, you know, pretty soon I started to believe that if I don't continue down this path, what people are going to stop talking about me. Yeah, exactly. And then I'll lose that identity and I'll lose that who I am deep down inside. And so you were talking to me a little bit about um, some of the darker things that you'd experienced uh, in the pre-interview earlier this week. How, how old were you when that started happening? And like, tell us a little bit about that. The eye-opening experiences of where my addictions and my personality, and my self-destructive tendencies were taking me uh, was pretty eye-opening when I was 16. So I remember being, you know, high, drunk, leaving a party with a good friend. We ran out of drugs. We ran out of alcohol. So what did we do? Well, I asked him where we could get our next fix, basically. And he knew of a place right away, in this house that had all the windows covered up. Then we walked into a dark basement, you know, and then we got down there and then same thing, all the windows were covered up by tinfoil and boards or whatever. There's about six to eight individuals, you know, from ranges of ages of 40 to 60 years old, uh, smoking, uh, drinking, you know, everything, all the paraphernalia was on the coffee table in front of them, of course, while they're sitting in a circle. And then me and my buddy sit down right at the circle with them. And, you know, my buddy asked these people if they have any, you know, cocaine for us, of course, to continue our, our adventures with. And they said, no, but we got this. And then I remember somebody passing down like a bag full of meth and a pipe. And it, it got pretty real. Did you do it? I... No. And you know what? That's one thing to this day that I've seen friends, I've seen different people in my life that I grew up close with that have taken that path in life and they've never came back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I really don't know if I'd be in that same boat, but one of the things that has stuck with me, even as a 28 year old now, you know, when I was 16 at that time is remembering a couple of, you know, knocks on a few doors. And there was a door that was down the hallway of the basement that we were, you know, all around a coffee table with. And it was a couple knocks, you know, it was two different people knocking from behind the door. And then pretty soon I heard a couple of voices call out and yell out, Mom, yeah, we're hungry. We want more food. We want actual food. And, you know, I remember thinking to myself, what the, what the hell's going on? And then, you know, a couple of voices again say, we want something more than pop and crackers and chips. And then, you know, later I found out from my friend at the time, after we left that basement, that uh, it's because when they, you know, do what they're doing on a weekend and get together and smoke meth, they lock the kids in that bedroom and, you know, give them whatever food they can uh, to basically <laughs> allow them to you know, if they get thirsty or they get hungry, well, they have a couple of cans of pop or they have chips and crackers. It, uh, it scared me. It, it scared me a great deal. So, man. so did that, did that change the trajectory of your life? You know, thinking back on it now, maybe it, it, it stopped me from ever attempting to smoke meth or, so you know, to use meth, but. Even even at this point, then, uh, as as far as you had gone with your with your with your drinking and and whatever else, you you still had a, a moral compass on some level. Part of my book that I am actually writing right now. Uh, so one of the chapters is how I grew my empathy, and my mom is a big part to play in that. Seeing my mom, you know, crying, bawling her eyes out, and she being up all night because she was watching videos of a great like catastrophe happening in the world so something like 9 11 or something like hurricane katrina you know some like major world events and i can remember very very vividly seeing my mom being in great shock she had this soft spot she had this you know this pain behind her eyes because she knew these people were going through these pains in life i definitely believe i have the heart that i do now because some of the things that I've witnessed growing up with, you know, my mom and uh, different, so, different realms. So there was a, there was a suicide attempt too. Um, what, what led up to that? It was a week before grade 12 started. 
me and my best friend were at a host party. We had a designated driver that night. I remember very clearly. Of course, when we did decide that, you know, maybe we should move on to the next party, it was my car keys in my pocket. Looking eye to eye with my best friend, you know, like in a split second, we hit a meridian. And then it shot my car towards some trees. It was like the world like froze, you know, like I can still see that image in my head. We hit that tree going about 116. I look over and, you know, I say to him, we have to get out of here. The cops are going to come. We're going to get arrested because, you know, you don't just hit a tree and walk away from it. I started raising my voice and I started yelling. Wake up, man. Like, come on, let's, let's go. Like, I thought he was just knocked out simply. And I remember actually, you know, passing out shortly after that because all the adrenaline and the contusions and, you know, the alcohol. I woke up in an ambulance, you know, just outside my vehicle in a pretty bad way, pretty bad emotional state. Once again, my body shuts itself down. I woke up in the hospital, strapped to a stretcher, and finding out my friend there was on his way to Saskatoon Hospital so that they could do the best that they possibly could to keep him alive that night. Uh, my mom was, you know, sitting right beside my bed. And I begged her, I begged her to take me home because I didn't want to be seen in public. I was quite embarrassed. I was quite ashamed of what had happened. I was so angry at the world. I was, I was emotional. I was upset. And I have a big smile on my face because I'm pretending that my buddy that is in the Saskatoon hospital at the time in a coma is going to survive because he's one of the toughest people I know in this world and he still is to this day. And so I heard somebody's voice say, yeah, I just talked to his parents. He's not making it through the night. I remember you know, going to my mother's basement. I remember being on my hands and knees, crawling around her basement, you know, trying to find nails. And then I remember after finding about five to seven of them, I took the belt off my waist and I hung the one side of the belt by the rafters. And like, I put the other side uh, around my neck and I jumped. With the fear, with the pain inside of you, was it the fear of the consequences along with the fear of losing your friends, along with the fear of what the community is going to think, or whether you're going to be exiled? Like, what was the most prominent thing in your mind that, that drove you to that place? I wasn't going to live with myself knowing my best friend wasn't going to be here anymore because of my actions. So you, you're here now. Uh, it didn't work. But I did remember waking up the next morning, man, with half the belt still hanging by my neck you know i'm laying on the floor on my back and i'm seeing the other half kind of like on the ceiling uh, i like sat up realized that you know that half of the belt is still there the other half is by my neck and i took the belt off my neck i looked around kind of didn't believe if i was still alive or not uh, i just went on about my day I kept that story to myself for probably two years. And the first person I told was my friend that I was in that car crash with. What did he say? I told him, I, I, he's like, oh shit, man. <laughs> he's like, well, we're still here for a reason. I'm just kind of curious, like with that admission to your best friend and given everything else that you guys have been through, how is your relationship today? He came to my store yesterday and we sat here and drank coffee for four hours and you know, that happens every so often, and it's something that I'm incredibly thankful for. I'm sorry, thankful for to this day because no one hated me more than myself. One day he said to me as a joke, he's like, Man, I still remember when people were trying to get me to sue you. And we, I was like, What? <laughs> I just, I, I didn't hear that. I didn't know that. But yeah. Well, people, good thing at the time too, right? Like, yeah. I think it's a good thing you didn't know that at the time. That would have been another layer of anxiety that I'm sure you didn't need. So, um, you said that you just went about went on about your day. Uh, that you you had this experience. You you tried to to end it, and then you just got up and and went about your day. So to me, that so you you kept using like that wasn't the end for you. Like what what brought you into recovery, if not that? You know what, and that is. Uh... A lot of people have asked me too, like, is that where your life turned around for the better? And, you know, I wish it was. I wish it was at that moment because, I mean, you don't go through many more moments in life like that, of mm -hmm. course, right? So why wouldn't that be the one? But, you know, I never knew I needed the extra help that I needed still to this point. And I was dealing with a whole lot more of baggage, to be honest. 
after that, right? Knowing that I tried to take my life, knowing that every single person that I come across to every day of my life doesn't know this, but I know this, you know, like Mm -hmm. my family didn't know it. I I just knew I kept on to this pain, but, and then what made it even worse, the only person that did know that I tried to take my own life was my friend that was in the car crash with me. And every single time I hung out with him, I would, I would get distraught. I would get like that PTSD. I would get that flashback. It would, it would play over and over in my head. So every single time I would go hang out with him, you know, I'd, I'd leave and think everything's okay. But my, my next urge would be to go use, would be go, you know, snort as much drugs as I could up my nose or drink, you know, the entire evening that night or whatever it was. And like over and over again, I, I didn't know this was happening. I just thought, you know, felt like business as I didn't usual. know what I thought. I thought it was business as usual. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good way to put it, man. Anyone that thinks recovery is, you know, a straight, straight line to like the beautiful life that we all live. Nobody uh, thinks that here. Is, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's because everyone knows here. Yeah. This is hard knocks not talks. Not necessarily case. <laughs> Two things that have stayed with me my entire life. The first thing was that I was going to go to jail at some point in my life if I didn't turn things around. Mm-hmm. When I was 16, many kids are told that they can go to university, they can go to college, they can start families, they can start careers, they can start businesses, whatever they're told when they're 16 to give them the most life that they ever have possibly could have imagined, of course. And the second thing that I was told was that your life is going to be over before you begin to actually truly start to live. That was the second thing I was told from this lovely lady that I used to work with at a grocery store back in the day. Language can be such an important thing when we're, you know, communicating to people who are in active addiction or mental health struggles. So could she have said it somehow differently? I was just so bullheaded. (laughs) I don't think it really mattered what people said in a different shape or form. I laughed it off and I kind of walked away. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tell us about the day you decided to stop the the day you decided to change your life one of the really altering moments of my life was in a person's garage actually that lived close to my mom's house and all we did was sit at his his you know garage snort drugs i remember getting home to my mom's house and being so high and i started yelling mom i can't breathe i was having hard times breathing he's like what the hell did you take what the hell did you take and i just remember putting her through a lot of pain and you know I remember thinking to myself, that's kind of to go back to what that lady said to me. The second thing is if you don't turn around your life, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be dead before your life begins to truly live. And that was replaying in my head a couple of times. That second, you know, that second statement that I was told was going to happen because she got the first one right. You stumbled around for a while, like so many of us do. I that's not that's not outside of uh, what would most would consider normal. But now you're sitting here in your store with your brand on the wall behind you, um, having yeah. people beating your door down, looking for mentorship and how to run a successful brand here in Saskatchewan. Like you've done amazing things, man. It's incredible. So why don't you tell us, uh, you know, uh, like we were talking before the show, and even I was like, I have great respect for you for being able to to build a brand from scratch and find the success that you've had. So clearly you've made some good decisions in your life, my friend. Um, when did that start happening? When did you start to see the light and, and start to move forward in a positive way? Like, do you remember the day? I created the brand, you know, six years ago out of the trunk of my car, okay, with about 100 t-shirts. Right around this time in January, not the best time to start any retail business, by the way, if anyone's listening and wants to start one yourself. Um, but it was part of my recovery. It was part of my uh, healing that I needed to do. And you know what? The reason why the brand Limitless came to mind is because one of my all-time favorite movies, of course, was Limitless with Bradley A. Cooper. Now, this mm. kind of contradicts the message, of course, because kind of he takes a pill. A lot yeah. of pills. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Doesn't but he end for up at me, least deep down microdosing, down, though? <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. He wasn't he, behaving he, like he was microdosing. That's for at sure. At the end. At the end. Come on down. Get with the program. Yeah. Sorry, Cody. Go ahead. No, that's and that's the tough part because the movie does contradict what I'm like where my life turned around. Right? It does. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, it wasn't the fact that the guy takes a pill and becomes this person that he is. 
It was the fact that this person could do that is what I really looked into. You know, it's the mm-hmm. fact that this guy could turn around his life for the better. It's, it's the fact that this guy could shift mountains and make beautiful things happen in this world and be a leader and be a person that wants to better the world. That is where my life started to turn around for the better. And of course, mm-hmm. after starting the brand, I did relapse a few times and, you know, full transparency because that's who I am. I'm being authentic. I'm being real. But I can damn sure tell you I'm really proud that it's been a few years and I'm damn thankful f- for that since I've touched drugs. And, you know, I'm never looking back. And I know that past is behind me and it's never coming back. I can promise you that. I told everyone what I wanted to see. I told everyone that I wanted to have a full store for one day for my brand. And I wrote that on a piece of paper about two months after starting this brand out of the trunk of my car. And I kept that piece of paper in my wallet for six months. And you know where that piece of paper is still to this day? It is in a picture frame. It's in a picture frame behind my counter in my store that we've had for three years in downtown Prince Albert. Mm. Something I'm incredibly thankful for because This brand, whether or not I do it forever the rest of my life is a different story. But it allowed me to be who I am now and it allowed me to be the person that I am thankful and I'm proud for today. And somebody who can take care of their family moving forward and somebody who's not gonna be the person who I used to be. You know, one of the recognitions that I was gifted for for the brand and my motivational speaking that I do now is this little puppy. You know, when I was named this little puppy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this little puppy. <laughs> and I was named Young Entrepreneur of the Year for Saskatchewan for 2021. When things get really stressful for you, uh, when your thoughts start to go sideways, what do you do? What do you do to bring yourself back? How do you unplug? Well, I do believe a lot of the work that I do now, you know, when it goes to speaking for treatment centers, high schools, elementaries, corporations, like I said, I think that keeps me grounded, man. I I do truly believe like I can go have a rough day here and there. Uh, Whatever happens, you know, a bill comes out of nowhere and it's a thousand dollars for whatever reason, whatever happens. And I can go speak the next day and that all melts away. Like it truly, it's, it's became one of my careers now, of course, and something I take care of my family, but not only take care of my family, it is something that heals me no matter what happens in the world. It allows me to continue on. It allows me to empower people. It allows me to believe that I'm actually making a freaking difference in this world. And like, if I didn't believe I was making a difference in this world, I can tell you right now, my mental health personally, because I know who I am, I know what I'm made of now can tell you it wouldn't be as strong as it is right now and you know i still have my low days whether or not you know my low days are as low as they used to be that's definitely not the truth right because i've learned a lot of techniques a lot sorry a lot of techniques a lot of strigs <laughs> knowing since you know what i used to know right i can tell you right now on a on a crappy day my first thought isn't to go get high because i know how crappier my days got because of mm-hmm. that back in the day but you know, Where having it a beautiful, it goes into being creative, man. It goes to like empower me for what I can do next. Mm-hmm. So I told our good mutual friend, Alan Keller, the other day that I have a damn ambitious goal. And that goal is, of course, to write my, my book that I want to write and finish it and send it off to an editor this month. Ooh. And you know where we're at right now? I have four chapters of that book. How many are you shooting for? Written. I want a dozen. I want a dozen. Mm -hmm. A dozen's a good number. Have you ever heard anyone tell you, or has anyone ever told you, or you heard tell anyone else, um, that your recovery can't be your work? Like, I've heard it said, I've heard it said a lot to, in, in like, counseling circles and stuff. Like, uh, uh, say there's a, a person who's found recovery in the program. Um, I've heard people in that program say, like, you can't get your recovery from your counseling job. Your recovery has to be separate from that. Has anyone ever said that to you? Believe it or not, my friend, I've never heard that just yet. Really? Until now. Well, now you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, you can't do that, Cody. You can't do that. <laughs> 
believe it or not, man, though, like truly it's, it's probably been one of the biggest things that I've done for my recovery. It's wanted to keep me on the straightened path. You know, I can relate. And like, and like everything yeah. that you just said there, like if, if I'm in a dark place and, and I have a really good, a really good conversation on a Sunday night and everything goes well, man, that's the fix. That is the fix. That, right that like, I, and you know, like that's in service to community. I've done, I've done good service work there. And that's, I mean, Donna's shaking her head cause she's seen, she's seen the difference just yeah. between, you know, like if, if I have a good day and I know that I've served community in a positive and productive way. That's it for me, you know? Yeah. So. And that's that's a beautiful thing, man, because this world needs more of that. This world needs more passion, lived purposes, and more people that want to provide service to others. Mm. Providing service to others is damn near one of the most selfish things a person can do. <laughs> it took me serving as many people as I possibly could to understand that because mm -hmm. after trying to do a speaking engagement, you know, to somebody to hopefully give somebody enlightenment or sorry, enlightenment or hope or whatever it might be that courage to want to, you know, be on that path. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't always get to hear it, leave an audience or leave in a school of mm -hmm. how that might've impacted people. But I definitely have to believe deep down inside that, that message got to at least one individual in that room that is going to hopefully make a better decision, whether that decision is five years or 10 years down the line. Mm -hmm. Knowing that that is a possible outcome is one of the things that continues to drive me moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, needing to hear that feedback all the time can be a dangerous thing because truth is, if you want to serve this world, you might not hear that feedback all the time. But you have to know that your intentions matter and trying to serve this community or serve whoever you might in this world is a very powerful thing with the right genuine intentions. We've got uh we've got Tommy from Unhooked Addictions and Wellness Coaching and I'm assigning tone to Tommy's voice here cuz like I know Tommy. He's like I've never heard that before. So, I guess Dan's <laughs> just crazy. I guess I'm just the only one that's ever heard that. <laughs> but he goes on, he goes on to say, uh, and I love you Tommy I'm, and thanks for joining tonight. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, sober talking at work helps me stay sober in my own life. So, so I guess Dan will just, just leave it alone then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta so, work, you gotta do what works for you though, right? Like for of sure. Of course, of course. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and like, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with, with the statement either because like I, I dive into my work and I get an, an abundance of fulfillment from fulfillment from what I do. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I said that, but anyways, hey, that's, um, okay. <laughs> that's okay. So what else, man? I mean, we're coming to the end here, but, uh, is there anything else that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure we do? Yeah, for sure. You know, like off the top of my head, I, this wasn't planned or scripted, but our world is moving towards a lot of addictions, a lot of mental health more and more. And my heart does break out for a lot of those people because anyone that's lived on that addiction side of drugs or whatever it might be, you understand that pain that that person is going through. Mm -hmm. And if I could ever say one thing to somebody is find something that you're passionate about, find something that drives you, find something that makes that addiction stronger or sorry, makes that purpose of fulfilling stronger than that addiction. You know, to go back on that fulfillment, for me personally, my fulfillment and my service to others has allowed me to promise myself to never want to fall back on those addictions. It's not necessarily the most ideal way of, you know, recovery, but I definitely know it works for me. And I definitely know a lot of people have similarities when it comes to gen uh, sorry, DNA makeup, whether that's ADHD, whether that's, you know, the also thinking that self-destructive tendencies or whatever it might be. As soon as you find something that you can actually live and put as much passion and creative knowledge and experience into, like we get to, thankfully, very much so, man, your world is like sky the limit. Truly, you can you can climb any mountain you ever wanted to, uh, you know, metaphorically or physically, whatever it might be. Understand that you as well, every single person in this world has a role to play and has a way to provide service to others is one of the most powerful things. And once you believe you have the ability and capacity to do great things. That is when life becomes limitless. 
There it is, brother. All right. Um, I guess we'll leave it there. Um, if y'all are watching, don't leave. We're going to spin the wheel in a bit. But for now, Cody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, what a great conversation. Thank you for sharing your experience and strength with us and showing us that it's possible to come out the other side of these things and to do great things. And uh, with that, we'll let you go, man. Take care. All right, if you're getting something out of what we're doing here, you can find all our audios on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts, or live and interactive, right here on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch TV. Thanks for watching. Take care, my friends. Say, this is Hard Knocks Talks. <laughs>